But we come to the pagan lady of Peel. I'm, in a way, I'm not happy about her being called a pagan lady. Um, I think she's much more than that. But of course, it was a name that um, cottoned on and it was good for publicity. This is the image of her in the museum. She looks very, very austere there, I think. Um, whether she was a wife of a chieftain, we don't know if she was married or not. There's no evidence of that, but there's a lot of things in her grave with her, including that little, le little leather pouch that she's wearing, which had her sewing kit in, a couple of knives, I've already mentioned the knives, some of the amulets, and of course, the necklace, the bead necklace. Now, this was... As I say, Sheila Crajean looked at this um, grave before the lintel was lifted off the top. And the day it was lifted, I think the um, conservator from the British Museum was over the following morning, very early on the first flight, lifted the things out of the grave and took them back to London for study. And we didn't hear anything more about them for some time. But when it did, it was very exciting because it was a woman. She had all sorts of things with her in her grave, including this necklace. You can see I've um, highlighted one of the beads. This is probably uh, made in Sweden. It's glass bead. Recycled Roman glass. Recycling is not new. And certainly it was very interesting to begin with. I think they thought it was actually a Roman bead, but in fact they decided it was a recycled one. This one was old when she, when she had it and possibly had belonged to one of the monks who had lived on the island before then, part of his prayer beads. Um, it's very hard, it's violence, and it's um, sixth century. So it was four or 500 years old when she got it. The interesting thing about this necklace is it's not one that's just put together all at once. It's a family heirloom. It tells the story, presumably, of the family, where they've been, their travels and so on. So it was a very, very precious thing to put in the grave with her. Amber, of course, from the Baltic. And this, this was the one that really blew people's minds. It's an extraordinary piece of workmanship for a start, because not only does that image go through the whole of the bead from one side to the other, like um, you know, Manx rock, but it also goes through in the other direction as well. An extraordinary piece of workmanship. And even more extraordinary, it came from Persia. And it was strengthened glass. Until then, all the glass had been made in the Roman style, which was very brittle, and you couldn't make very large objects out of it. So now suddenly you've got technique, which the Vikings brought back with them from Persia, um, now modern day Iran, of course, and they were able to make this strengthened glass. They, they didn't make this, this came back from Iran, from Persia, but it was just in time for the building of these great abbeys and monasteries, which needed big windows. And suddenly you've got the technology to make very strong glass and windows. It, these were studied at the University of York. Julian Henderson said this, opened up a new chapter in the study of British glass technology. So that was, that was really pretty exciting for us. So who was the pagan lady? She was buried with all her equipment she wasn't allowed to go to the next world without her kitchen tools. Two knives, as we've seen, her sewing kit, a roasting spit, the only one found outside of Scandinavia so far, and there's only one in Scandinavia, and that's in Bergen, unless I'm out of date on that. That might, might have been. Was she a Celt or a Viking? Well, we know now because they've done the DNA. She was dressed in Celtic fashion. Well, sort of Celtic fashion, as we know now. They, they were wearing a bit, of, a bit of Scandinavian, a bit of our local stuff. Buried in a Christian cemetery, but with, with pagan grave goods. Amongst her grave goods was a goose wing. And that caused a lot of interest. I think most people came to the conclusion it was for dusting. And I thought, really? Anyway, any, anyone who keeps bees? Any beekeepers here? I've had beekeepers come up to me after the talk and say, I keep bees and I still use goose wings for cleaning out the hives. So it's quite possible she was a beekeeper. And her head was resting on a pillow filled with goose down and she was wearing a little white cap as well. So she was being laid there with great care and great love. So we now know that she came from the Scandinavian world 
which could have been Norway, Denmark, Sweden, or Northern Europe, because it wasn't, I think the DNA that was done was not specific. But um, at least we know she was first generation 